Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa one of the impressions that uh, uh, it's easy to to get in um, listening to Buddhist teachings and uh, reflecting on those is that um, every kind of desire is um, problematic, and and so this uh, these are the kind of phrases that get used all the time. Desire is the cause of suffering, and um, that. Uh, that's you know, commonly taken to be the the case, and then uh, we can be uh, puzzled by well, how does that work? Because um, surely there must be um, you know, if if every kind of desire, or every kind of directing of the mind was uh, intrinsically um, deluded or um, productive of, of suffering, then yeah, if uh, if that was the case, well, how would an arahant and a fully enlightened being, how would they do anything? You know, the, and you get, and you, so in, in some Buddhist scriptures, uh, not in the, the the canon, but in the in the commentaries, you get these d- descriptions that make it come across as though an arahant is a kind of zombie in robes. You know, that they kind of can't do anything for themselves; they have to be sort of moved around and fed and looked after. Other, because you know, if, if an arahant isn't sort of um, uh, sort of attended to and and um, looked after like a kind of um, uh, a uh, a disabled person in, in a in a wheelchair that needs to be sort of fed and watered and looked after. You know they couldn't do anything for themselves. They couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't uh, you know, eat or um, make any kind of um, a d- a decisive or um, choice based uh, they couldn't take any choice based action and uh i would say this is a radical misunderstanding <laughs> and that uh, it, i remember coming across these sort of descriptions or references to an arahant you know not being able to look after themselves and i think well that's that doesn't seem right <laughs> there's something there's something strange or something out of whack about that kind of a picture and if you consider the Buddha's own life, you know, the, the Buddha as a fully enlightened, completely liberated being, he did an awful lot of choosing. He um, uh, directed his, his life, he made uh, imaginative, you know, creative choice of, of words, he gave you know, 84,000 Dhamma talks uh, collected together in the teachings, he established the monastic order, he, uh, if you go through the books of the, the Vinaya discipline, the monastic rule, um, along with the the main precepts that we have, there's something like ten thousand minor rules and observances, and they were all established by the Buddha and uh, during the Buddha's lifetime. So there was a lot of <laughs> a lot of direction was being given, a lot of choice. So I mean, do this, don't do that. This is appropriate. That's not appropriate. Um, and then just the, the the Buddha establishing monasteries, wandering from place to place, giving teachings. Um, there was an awful lot of decision making and um an action being taken you know the buddha was not a zombie <laughs> he was not incapable of looking after himself or, or setting direction and making choices so what this points to is that um the uh, it, it can't be the case that every single kind of desire or every kind of way of directing the mind towards uh, an object or towards a goal uh, it can't be the case that that is uh, intrinsically unwholesome or, or out of out of balance. And and indeed, when we look at, a bit more closely at the teachings, you you find that it's um, specifically tanha uh, that is labelled is named as the 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 cause of dukkha. Dukkha samudaya. What is the arising of dukkha? The arising of of um, dissatisfaction discontent incompleteness insecurity that that is um based upon tanha which uh, as i said it literally means thirst 
Uh, and uh, the English word craving is probably the best translation for that. So if you've, if you've been paying close attention, <laughs> you'll notice that I always use craving as a translation for tanha rather than desire for precisely the reasons I'm you know, referring to now. Because you can't really have a skillful craving. Yes, so the English word craving implies a kind of Sort of agitated, slightly deranged. You know, you, if the mind is in a state of craving, that you, you've 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 lost it. You know, you 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 haven't got the a quality of composure, and so that's why I feel craving is a is a a better word because it's there's a, a an agitated, uh, unmindful, imbalanced, and and self self centered element within that. So the word for another word for desire, or the the, um, the the most common word for desire in Pali is chanda, C H A N D A, chanda. And although you can have uh, unskillful kinds of chanda, like uh, karma chanda, like sense desire, you can also have dhamma chanda, like desire for the dhamma. And as uh, you know, the, the Buddha points out, you know that this. Um, quality of chanda is a prerequisite for uh, any kind of spiritual development any kind of uh, of uh, effort that we make the first um, quality that needs to be present is that uh, of chanda there needs to be that sense of, of interest or engagement the mind has to you know pick up uh, pick that up as a uh, as a, a a goal it has to sort of say yes i want to do this Now the um, there's a, a collection of um, qualities that are called the idipada or the four bases of success. So this is um, a, a little group of qualities the Buddha put together and uh, pointed out how uh, to achieve anything, whether it's wholesome or unwholesome or neutral. So whether it's uh, the effort to be enlightened or the effort to um, uh, cook a, a meal or whether it's the effort to, to go and shoot somebody. Yeah. Uh, whether it's ho- uh, wholesome, unwholesome, or or neutral, the uh, these four qualities need to be present. And the first is chanda. There needs to be interest. So, along with desire, you can translate chanda as interest or enthusiasm or zeal. Um, so, it's that uh, a- attribute of mind which which goes to an object and and it, uh, say picks it up, is interested in, it, engages with it. So, there needs to be interest. So, if you want to shoot somebody, <laughs> you have to be interested. That if you want to cook a meal, you have to be interested. If you want to be enlightened, you have to be interested in that. So whether it's on the scale from you know from uh, completely unwholesome to to very wholesome, that that quality of chanda needs to be there. And then the second quality of these four is um, virya, as the uh, virya means energy. So after having uh, aroused interest, they're interested to to carry out some task, there needs to be the application of energy ready to. Readiness to to engage, to to apply effort, energy, and to to actually do something. Then the third one is chitta, which in this respect means thinking. So you need to think about what it is that you want to do. Like you want to cook a meal, you want to be enlightened. The, that uh, okay, how do we how do we go about doing this? What are the ingredients that we need, or, or what the, um, what's the best way to to go about this? So chitta means uh, the mental consideration the the thinking things through about what you what you want to do and then the fourth one is very interesting uh, the fourth one is vimangsa so vimangsa literally means reviewing so after you've um, got interested you've t- uh, taken action and thought, thought about what you wanted to do then vimangsa is looking at the result of what you just did so did it work okay you wanted to you wanted to prepare a meal so did it work out you know, how did the meal come out did it did it work did it not work um, so vimangsa is that sense of looking back at the the results of your efforts and seeing well, what was what was the effect of that? You know, is, did it have a uh, did, was the the wished for result achieved? Was it not achieved? How did that work? So in, in this respect, and particularly in terms of sp- uh, spiritual effort, you know, the um, the the quality of of chanda or desire. Is essential. You have to be interested to wake up. You have to be interested to 
to uh, say understand your your mind your life you have to be interested to uh, uh, say get beyond your um, your uh, attachments and insecurities your addictions and so forth and uh, Ajahn Chah was also a very um, regularly addressing this theme uh, for precisely the same kind of reasons because people would say say well you know all, all kinds of desire you know, desire is a cause of suffering and he said well actually you needed to desire to come here to Wat Bapong to, <laughs> to this monastery you know if you didn't have desire you wouldn't have come here you know you had you all had to have the desire to come to this retreat spend the ten days here in the hot box yeah <laughs> sizzling Hertfordshire well, actually it's but if you think it's better somewhere else, it's sizzling in Ireland, it's sizzling in Boston, it's sizzling in Cal. It's even somebody wrote to me from California said uh, it has been between 109 and 111 this last few days. So this is only about 80 here. You know, it's only 28.4 degrees centigrade here. It's positively balmy. So in Sacramento, it's 110. So count yourselves lucky. You know. <laughs> So uh, uh, the um, the desire to come and spend a, a time on a ten day retreat, the desire to um, do ourselves some some favors uh, in terms of training the mind, learning to understand our unskillful habits, learning to let go of them, learning to the desire to develop skillful habits and to um, do the best we can with our life. These are these are desires, but they are they are. Um, they're, 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 they are chanda, they're, they're, but they are kusala, they're, they're wholesome, they're beneficial. So in this respect, we shouldn't be afraid of desire. <laughs> uh, and that uh, the, uh, the important thing within this is, to, in a sense, to get to know the difference between the, uh, the desire which is tanha, which is the sort of agitated, self-centered craving, and then chanda, which is the capacity that we have to direct the mind towards a goal, like uh, say coming to be on retreat, or, or like the cooks and managers uh, making the effort to look after the retreat and to t take care of all of us in in such a good and uh, comprehensive way. That there, there needs to be that uh, that desire. So uh, a lot of um, the uh, the say the attention that I've been giving in this retreat learning to recognize the difference between feeling and, and craving it's got a parallel um, as a, a comparable way of, of a, or a comparable distinction to learn how to make to be able to distinguish between the desires that lead to suffering and the desire that uh, helps to end suffering you know, the, to discern the difference between what is chanda, like the capacity to direct the mind towards a, a goal and to put uh, effort and energy into that, um, and uh, the uh, the difference between that and and self-centered craving, and not just as we've been talking about, not just sort of craving for you know, more food or a, a cigarette or a, a or a new application for your iPhone or a, a, whatever our, our, our object of desire of this week. <laughs> A desire du jour might be that you know, whatever the mind happens to crave that uh the difference between that um the 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 craving for for an object whether it's coarse or fine or the the the, the tanha of sense desire of um karma tanha or the subtle kinds of craving of bhava tanha the desire to become and vibhava tanha the desire to get rid of these subtle kinds of craving, uh, as I was mentioning a few days ago, these are uh, f almost invisible. They are hard to discern, but they they are important to 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 be able to recognize the, the difference between um, what is chanda, the application of, of of effort and giving the mind direction in a skillful way, and what is going to be obstructive and causing more insecurity, alienation, and, and dukkha. Well, uh, this is a, a theme I, I feel it's important to to explore, and uh, even though it might seem a bit subtle, I feel it, it's very important to, to work at, because this can be very confusing. It can be very, um, say, bewildering how we're supposed to 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 learn the difference between these because when you look at bhava tanha like it can be that 
the bhavatana, the desire to become that that self-centered, you know, subtle kind of self-centered craving. It can be the 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 desire to become um, concentrated, the desire to to get jhana, the desire to to be a good meditator, the desire to to have loving kindness for all beings. It can be that you know that uh, bhavatana can latch on to extremely wholesome objects, uh, or the the uh, uh, vibhavatanha, the desire to get rid of, seeing our uh, our feelings of of uh, uh, lustfulness or of laziness or of jealousy, and and uh, the desire to get rid of that. that. Oh, I wish I could. I've got a terrible problem with lust. I've got a terrible problem with jealousy. I'm terribly lazy. I wish I could get rid of my laziness. I wish I could get rid of my chattering thoughts. I want to get rid of my my uh, rampant uh, sexual desire or my rampant. Uh, irritation, my complaining mind. If I could just switch off my complaining mind, then everything would be great. So, when we look at these, uh, and we can consider, well, hang on a minute. If you hear the teachings, it, it seems to be talking all the time about getting rid of the chattering mind, or getting rid of, of greed and hatred and delusion. It, it seems to talk a lot about you know, getting jhana, or, or getting insight, or becoming enlightened. Yeah, Aren't these supposed to be what we're trying to do here right um so uh, uh it's uh, it's helpful to to in a way tease apart just the, the the expressions that we use the kind of words that we use like say getting concentrated or becoming uh, uh enlightened or getting rid of our our, um, uh, our chattering thoughts to to tease apart just the what we what we say in terms of uh, the the language that we use and the the kind of terminology that is familiar to us and what the attitude is in the heart because uh, uh, it certainly is the case when you you look at the buddha's teachings and when we practice yes it is uh, a beautiful and noble thing to develop the capacity to concentrate it's it's beautiful and, and noble helpful to develop insight to cultivate wisdom it's beautiful and helpful to let go of distracted thoughts, to let go of greed, hatred, and delusion. Those are indeed there, right there in the texts and in the Buddha's teaching. These are praised as being wholesome, beautiful, noble, liberating. So, what are we, you know, how how can we tell the difference between the the kind of bhavatana vi bhavatana, the desire to become, the desire to get rid of, that's the trouble you know, the problem, the troublemaker, and the uh, and these other the development of these qualities that are helpful and liberating, and it's even more, even more confusing because one is called bhava. The, the 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 problem is called bhava, and the the solution is called bhavana. So they even sound like each other. It's like gee, this is getting really confusing. So one is bhava, so that's the bad stuff, and then there's bhavana, which is med- meditation and development, which is the good stuff. So uh, how do we tell the difference between the two? Well, it is difficult because they are very like each other. They bear a very close resemblance. And the example I often use is our hands, like the, the left hand and the right hand. On one level, they're, they're exactly like each other. They're a perfect match for each other. But in another sense, they're the complete opposite. Right? <laughs> so in, in this way, the, the, the um, trying to become... Uh, concentrated, trying to be, trying to get insight, trying to be enlightened, or trying to get rid of our, our problems, trying to to get rid of our anger and jealousy and so forth. That um, that can look very much like um, you know, following what the instructions are in terms of, uh, of um, uh, living skillfully and developing uh, our spiritual life. But the key difference is that. When uh, it's bhava, when it's the, the conducive to creating more alienation and, and suffering and difficulty, there's always a self-centered element, the, the, the self-view, sakaya ditti, or this kind of narcissistic focus on me and mine. I want to get concentrated. I want to get jhana. I want to have insight for the benefit of all beings. <laughs> I want to, uh, I need to get rid of, I, I've got a problem with, with uh, insatiable thinking and I need to get rid of my chattering mind. I need to get rid of my anger. I've got a terrible anger problem. If I could get rid of my anger problem, then there'll be me without the anger, and then that would be wonderful. 
So it's all laced uh, and threaded through with I and me and mine, all seeming very, very reasonable. But I have got an anger problem. You know, I am full of anxiety. I am. <laughs> and on the, the ordinary everyday level, because that we can say, yeah, that, that might be true, that maybe anger is a common feeling. Maybe the mind has got strong habits of chattering away and uh, getting lost in conceptual proliferation. Um, and, and that those habits are strong. But the very way that they're being held that I've got a, an anger problem, I'm, I've got a fear problem, I've got a, uh, a chattering mind, you know, I want to get more concentrated, I need to develop more insight. That the very way they're being held is that there's a me here who possesses these, these issues, who needs to get rid of this stuff and get, uh, and get hold of that stuff, and then there'll be a me who's, who's, <laughs> got, who's uh, got everything together. So it's all cast in I and me and mine. The self view is uh, is threaded uh, and pervading you know, that whole attitude. So as long as self view is there, sakaya ditti, then the the result is going to be painful. Whereas um, Lumpur Sumedho, in his inimitable way of of summarizing thing, these things very very simply, he said, if you start off with avijja, you start off with ignorance and self view, you end up with dukkha. If it begins with self-view, the result is suffering. If it begins with, with wisdom, if, it, if you begin with vijja, uh, if, uh, if you start off with right view and wisdom, then the result is nibbana. It's very easy to remember. You can kind of <laughs> jot that down in your, in your memories. So if you start off with ignorance, the result is suffering. If you start off with wisdom, the result is nibbana. That's all we need to know. <laughs> so... The other, uh, on the other side of it, what the, the bhavana side, what is the, the actual skillful development, um, when we, we look at, at that, when that, that the, the desire is wholesome, when the, the chanda is, is dhamma chanda, is actually that the desire is in tune with reality, then uh, what we are doing is we're, we're practicing right effort. There is the, uh, um, the development of right effort, samavayamo. And again, another handy little list of four qualities that the Buddha described. So the definition of right effort is, is in four parts. Another little Pali lesson. Uh, the first one is sangvara, which means restraint. So restraining the unwholesome from arising. So making the effort to restrain the feelings of, uh, of greed or jealousy or fear or anger, uh, craving. Restraining the, the, the unwholesome from arising. Uh, the second one is um, pahana. If the unwholesome has arisen, if there's already a feeling of, of anger or, or fear or craving, uh, whatever it might be, that if that's already arisen, the effort to let go. So sangvara, restraining the unwholesome from arising, if it's already arisen, then to let it go. The third one is bhavana, or to, de to develop, to cultivate the wholesome, to consciously bring the wholesome into being, like to consciously develop uh, loving kindness or compassion, consciously develop uh, the faculty of concentration or developing wisdom. So bhavana is the conscious development of of the wholesome. And then the fourth one is anurakana, uh, which means to protect or to, to hold or to cherish, to maintain. So whatever wholesome qualities have arisen uh, or have been brought into being, then the effort to maintain those. Now again, it can seem, well, hang on a minute, I thought it was all about... <laughs> We were just saying how I want to become concentrated, I want to have insight, I want to, I want to have loving kindness, I want to get rid of my anger, I want to get rid of my selfishness and jealousy. You know, how is that different from, from what I just described as right effort, with restraining the unwholesome from arising or letting the unwholesome go, or cultivating the wholesome and maintaining it in being? Well, the difference is that, that right effort, all of that, is uh, cultivated, is established without any kind of self-view. That's, that's not a, a me. There's not a me who's developing right effort. If, it's, if there's a me doing, doing the, the, um, the, the right effort, right efforting, <laughs> then it's not right effort. It's not samma. Because the essence of, of that, as what makes that a, an aspect of the path, is that... Um, there's no sakayadi, there's no self-view, there's no um, I and me and mine woven into those efforts. The, the uh, right efforts, samavayamo, 
that is uh, motivated and guided by mindfulness and, and wisdom. It's not coming from, it's not uh, affected by any habits of, of self-creation, of uh, eye-making and, and mind-making. So, like the left and the right hand, they, they might look like each other, but they're also complete opposites, because when there's the practice of, of right effort, uh, all of, there is there is a directing. Yeah, they, you're directing the attention towards um, let, letting go of the unwholesome. Uh, letting is the, you're directing the attention to cultivating the wholesome. There's definite steering going on. There's a choice of <laughs> yes, not this path, that one. Yeah, not this direction, that one. Uh, there's a choosing going on, but that choice is uh, based upon is guided by mindfulness and wisdom, not by. I want this, I don't want that, I call this good, I call that bad, yeah. I want to become this, I don't want to become that. So there's a, a completely different attitude, the, the, the way in which those qualities are, are being uh, addressed and worked with is, uh, is utterly different than the, um, the, the, the attitude where the, there's an a I and me and mine uh, that is the sort of driving force of that whole process. So this is, uh, I feel, um, an important principle to understand because when we begin to see these things in this way, then we realize we don't have to be afraid of giving the mind direction. It's not a, uh, it's not that any kind of directionality or choice is intrinsically going to be problematic or somehow in, uh, uh, choose a, a choice or a decision is some sort of intrusion upon peacefulness or uh, is not like, disturbing our, our natural inner quiet but when a, a, a choice is guided by mindfulness and wisdom that uh, is actually conducive towards peacefulness and clarity it doesn't it's not like a, a, a disturbance uh, again that sometimes we get this impression that that we think of peace equals this kind of ultra passivity, like just a kind of completely neutralized passive state. And any kind of doing, any sort of doingness, is somehow an intrinsic disturbance of of my peace. But if your if your peace depends on a, on a complete passivity, you are going to suffer because the world does not sit still. That the, the the world keeps keeps changing, and that uh, we have a body, we have a mind, and so if your peace, your uh, your sense of peace is is uh, requ is based on a requirement of having no disturbance, and no thing to do, no engagement, it's going to be a very short lived peace, and it's going to be very very fragile. And I would say that isn't actually really a peace, in my humble opinion. <laughs> That isn't really peace at all. It's a kind of frozen quietude, but it's it's not the 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 genuine peace of nibbana, because when the when there is that uh, genuine quality of peacefulness, when the heart is truly attuned to to dhamma, to the the way things are, then there's no need to be afraid of stuff happening or things to be done. Like the, if you again, if you go back to the taking the Buddha's life as an example. So the Buddha was, was completely uh, attuned to the Dhamma. His, his mind was completely at peace with things. But that peace was not disturbed or agitated when he was traveling about, talking to people, doing things, and uh, engaging in, in uh, directing the, the Sangha and um, advising the, the broader community. That peace was undisturbed, even in the midst of all that, that activity. So that when um, when we look at it in this way, then rather than um, kind of looking towards an absence of activity or an absence of, of decision making or an absence of uh, initiative as being peace, <laughs> but rather the uh, um, the attunement of uh, of the of the heart to dhamma, then we find that we can make choices we can we can do things we can take action we can be engaged with people we can look after our responsibilities and not uh, have that being something seen or held or felt as something which is somehow disturbing or an intrusion or a a, a, a bother now culturally um yeah, that that's that's a, that's a a weird thing to be thinking because culturally we have the kind of 
I'm looking forward to the holiday. Oh, thank God it's Friday. Mm. Or oh, when I retire, when it's all over, then I'll be happy. Or oh, when this is finished, oh, wouldn't that be nice? Mm. Right? There's a strong cultural conditioning of like, if, if I've got to do something, it's a bother. And when I don't have to do anything, that's great. Then that we can have we can have peace. There's a, there's a a a kind of praising or a, a worshiping of just switching off and not doing, not feeling, of zoned out. The kind of, well, which is a kind of zombie like <laughs> existence. We call peace that sort of neutralized uh, dis disengagement. But uh, I would say that if that's again, if that's our view of of real peace, then of course. 10,000 things can come along and disturb it and anything that we have to do or that is uh, um, seen as, as uh, activity or, or work you know, or some something that uh, I need to engage with that's held as uh, as disturbing the peace but if we shift the attitude and then we instead see that real peace comes from right view real real peace comes from letting go of self-centered thinking self-centered attitudes then we can find that we can quite happily engage with with others and and uh, we're not waiting for it all to be over for uh, us to have a, a peaceful time but actually even in the midst of activity in the midst of engagement there is a quality of spaciousness of clarity of peacefulness and we're not waiting for the absence of of activity or, or stimulation or or even the absence of taking responsibility or initiative we are able to, to to be in the midst of that and that we can re see how it doesn't actually necessarily uh, intrinsically disturb the quality of peace you know, peace is not a matter of what the world is doing or even what we as an individual are engaging in but the real peace is in the attitude of how everything is held so you can be in the midst of a, a blizzard <laughs> Uh, of activity and uh, responsibility and engagement and and yet the heart being quite uh, uh, spacious and undisturbed and you know, attuned to things but not not thrown around not not caught up and not not waiting for it to be over so i feel this is a, a very important theme to to reflect upon because it is so common for uh, for all of us, most of us if not all of us and that we we uh, we long for peace and we always, we always take it to be dependent on what the world around us is doing um, and we miss the fact that it's uh, it's really based so much on the <coughs> the attitude the way we hold things in our heart and that if we can train, use the meditation and use this time together, uh, this retreat situation, to learn how to make effort with, without that uh, effort imbued with, with self-view, without the eye-making and mind-making, in Pali it's called ahankara, mamankara, eye-making and mind-making, then uh, life becomes a lot easier. <laughs> we, we find ourselves... Um, uh, unburdened uh, and uh, able to take care of the the, the uh, different aspects of what we are interested in and what we need to do, what our responsibilities are, and that we can do that all with a much lighter and uh, and uh, more spacious attitude. So it's a tremendously useful skill, and uh, we can also see how that. Uh, <coughs> that effort the the energy that we put into things that the choices that that we make uh that uh, we can say give direction to our life and we are not creating the kind of emotional stress of always wanting success and always fearing failure because in in, in the normal way of things at least from my experience when you make decisions and choices based on self-view, like when I, and then it's like I want to succeed, I want to get this right, I don't want to get it wrong, I want this to be, I want this to go well, and if it goes well and, and I succeed, that's a good thing. And if it doesn't succeed and if it fails and that and I get it all wrong, then that's bad and that's the that's the worst thing and we don't want that to happen. And so the heart ties itself to the hope for for success and the fear of failure. So. 
Um, is, is this common experience? <laughs> I think uh, it's kind of a safe bet. <laughs> so we, we do this all the time to ourselves, that we, we're hoping for success and we're fearing failure. And so that any every choice that we make, whether it's a large scale or small scale, then it gets uh, colored, it gets sort of, uh, affected by that wanting things to go well and, and fearing things are going to go badly. Now, when we learn how start to, to learn how to to apply energy and effort, uh, make choices based more on mindfulness and wisdom, and we let go of self viewing that, then we relate to, to choices and, and um, initiatives that we take or things that we do in a, in a very different way. So, in a, in a sense, we're still looking for success. You know, we're, we're trying to do things in a way that look as though they have a, a helpful outcome for ourselves and others. But then when we make a choice, say, okay, let's uh, head down this track, this looks like a good way forward. Um, and then you, you make a choice and then you uh, you find, oh, that really went well. People seem to be happy and it all seemed to be, come to a, a good result. Uh, there was a, uh, seemed to be uh, everyone smiling and pleased. Okay, rather than, look at me, I got it right. You know, I scored a point, you know, well done me. And kind of getting drunk on that success then we're able to recognize, oh, well, that went well, so what does this teach me? <laughs> and, uh, okay, that, that seemed to give a good result, so uh, what looks like a, be a good way forward from here? So you recognize, okay, that, was, that brought some benefit, and that was helpful, and people enjoyed that. So uh, rather than making that in, into uh, like a, an ego booster and getting lost in that and, so, and claiming that as some kind of personal achievement, like, look at me, I'm wonderful, I got it right, it's more seen in a pragmatic sense. Okay, that that worked well, so let's let's duly note that, and then see how that informs where we go from here. What looks like a good step forward from here. Similarly, if things go badly and things it doesn't work out, and everyone looks miserable and is staring at the carpet and is leaving as quickly as they can, then rather than oh my god, I'm a failure. It all it all fell apart. You know, what well, an idiot. What do they think? Of, you know, what do they think of me? Yeah, you know, the mysterious they. Uh, whose full-time job is to judge our actions. <laughs> you know, they, them, you know, who's, that, that's their role in the world, is to judge me. <laughs> then, to, instead of, of having that broken into a million pieces feeling and uh, desperately trying to get away from that, you know, the Soka Parideva Dukkha Domana Supayasa, to uh, to to in a sense let go of the self view the the selfing habits and to recognize well that didn't work did it <laughs> that was, so what does that teach me so what is that uh, okay that one didn't work out so um, what what is there to learn from that and again not getting lost or or, or, or entangled not not getting drunk on the on the feeling of failure but just okay well that one didn't work so uh, let's let's explore you know how that uh, uh, how that happened, and what does this teach me? What looks like a that being the case, this having fallen completely flat, what looks like a good way forward from here? So, again, that uh, that you're 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 discerning, you're you're making judgments. Okay, this worked, this didn't work. Everyone looks miserable, and, and there's a painful result. Okay, duly noted. You're not pretending that that didn't happen. You're not pretending. Oh, hooray! How marvelous! It all fell apart. You know, I, actually, I really wanted it to go this way. You know, that's what I really intended was for everyone to be miserable. I was just testing them. You know, you're not pretending that, but but uh, you're just being um, practical and straightforward and you're honest. Okay, well, that was that was a disaster. So, um, what does this teach me? So that you're making use, you're you're learning from both what you call a success and you call a failure. And in this light, I think it's also helpful to re to consider how. Uh, if you look back at your life, say over the last five or ten years, can you think of, a, of an incident or an event where at the time you thought, great, I'm so happy I've got this new job. Fantastic, I've married this person. I've joined this monastery. You know, I've moved into this new house. I've got this, you know, this fantastic, new, you know, this wonderful place in this, in this neighborhood. Great, how marvelous. It's, you know, just just think the last five or ten years, one of those, and then a couple of years later, you're thinking, "Oi, 
I can't believe I was celebrating when I got this job. Or that, you know, I, that uh, the thing that you were rejoicing over, that you thought was so marvelous, so wonderful, that you were so happy that you, you got the job, or you passed the exam, or you married the person, or you divorced the person. <laughs> and then five years later thinking, what on earth was I thinking of? Yeah, and that what you were celebrating and rejoicing in um, turned out to have all these other attributes, <laughs> the 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 rest of the stuff that went along with it, with that wonderful house and that fantastic neighborhood, you got that neighbor. <laughs> yeah, you suddenly find yourself with a neighbor from hell. You know that your perfect house is made even worse; it's made unbearably painful because you got this neighbor <laughs> who's making your life miserable, and. Uh, you didn't reckon on that, so that uh, that which we were we thought was a success and was wonderful, and we were we were rejoicing, then uh, it turned into something painful and difficult. Similarly, if you go back again five or ten years somewhere in our memory, we can we can probably all of us think of an incident where at the time we, we would we thought this is terrible, it's all fallen apart, you know, I'm finished, this is a disaster. Right, think of one of those. <laughs> probably all got a few of them. And then uh, consider how a few years later you realize, well, I would never have chosen that, but actually that was the best thing that happened to me. Right? Yeah. Can anybody think of a few of those? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so therefore, what kind of a light does that show? And does that shine on our judgments of this is a failure, or this is a success? When we see a success or something that's good, how sour and difficult that can turn. And similarly, something that's bitter and painful, how helpful and, and beneficial that can turn out to be. So when you really look at that and allow that into the heart, you, then it, it, you're, you're really uh, giving yourself um, a, uh, uh, a lot of blessings. <laughs> you're you're uh, broadening your view of the, the way that, that you, you regard things. So rather than when things go well, thinking, hooray, this is marvelous, then you're considering, well, I wonder what comes along with this one. <laughs> like, yes, this was the, the uh, I'm calling this the perfect house, now I wonder who I'm living next door to. <laughs> or that, yeah, I got the perfect job, but oh, yeah, what about these people that I'm working with now? Or, I finally got the promotion, and at last I'm head of department. Yeah, now I have to look after all these people. All right. <laughs> There's this, uh, all this that comes along with it. Aha. Uh -huh. So then, or, or that when things fall apart and, and, and it's a disaster, then similarly, like, okay, well, I would never have chosen this, but I wonder what, uh, I wonder what benefits, I wonder what opportunities this opens up that, uh, that what, what might come along with this. So in, in this way, we are, uh, say, expanding our view and, and looking at the choices that we make and the experiences of success or failure in, in a much broader way. And that uh, we are, are able to recognize that when we, we hold our experience, when we relate to, um, to decision-making and choices uh, in, the, in this way, then uh, <coughs> our life becomes a lot, uh, in a way, a lot simpler and a lot more spacious. We're not... Uh, tied to the fear of failure and the desire for success. We're not creating that kind of tension in our heart. But there's a, a responsivity, a, a sense of, of um, a, a kind of freshness that we, we bring to each moment. Now, when we look at the mind in the meditation, and um, you know, we might be able to see how well, the sound of a, of a plane coming into Luton Airport it doesn't really feel like me and mine. There's a hearing, and okay, well, there's a that that sound is is not something that I own. Yes, there's a, maybe a feeling of an of a me here who's doing the hearing, but I wouldn't say I'm the owner of that sound. It's definitely not me and and mine. Easy to see, easy you know to to, to recognize that. But then uh, a feeling in the body, a sensation in the body, or a, a thought passing through the mind. You know, when it's on the inside, it can be a bit harder. Like, well, that does feel like my, you know, the pain in my knee or the weight of my body on the on the cushion or the, you know, this thought. And it's it's my memory, 
no one else remembers exactly this way. This is my memory. So that feeling of I and mine can, can be more densely woven into a, a physical sensation or a thought. But when there, when we, there's a development of of, uh, of insight, and we use the reflections on anicca, dukkha, anatta, then in the same way, just like they can, they can relate to the sound of a of a plane passing over, or the sound of a thought passing through the mind. Then, oh, well, actually, what really is the difference between a thought in the mind and the sound of a plane or a pigeon? It's actually just a pattern uh, forming. Uh, it does its thing, it begins, it ends, it arises, it passes away. Oh, that too, it doesn't really have an owner, it's not really me and mine. Aha! So, with a thought or a fe- uh, sensation, then uh, that feeling of, uh, of, of self, of I and mine, can be let go of. And emotions uh, are a bit harder, yeah? at least in my experience, than just a passing thought. That that feel the feeling of regret or the feeling of irritation or the feeling of desire. When the the mind is drawn into an emotional state, then it can that can be uh, in a way you're getting further into the the reptile brain. <laughs> you can definitely feel like me. It's I you know I want or I hate. I can't stand you know, and so that. That I and me and my feeling can be more densely and deeply rooted, but again, hopefully, and during this this time, there have been uh, opportunities where you've been able to to recognize. Oh, look, even that that uh, that emotional state, that, uh, that that the feeling of resentment or the feeling of craving or the feeling of uh, fear, that too is not genuinely and completely who and what I am. It doesn't really have an owner. It too is anatta. It's it's not self. So in kind of going in layer by layer, um, we can, as the practice develops, we can see more and more uh, deeply into these uh, patterns of experience and see the, the, the truth of, of anatta in, in these. But when it comes to decision-making, it, uh, when it comes to a choice, it, it can uh, beyond a thought, beyond an emotion, beyond a physical sensation. It can really feel like, well, there's me who's choosing. <laughs> there's a, this is me deciding. This is there's a, definitely feels like an I who am choosing this you know, rather than that. But uh, I, in exactly the same way, I would encourage just bringing these reflections on on uh, anatta to explore even the 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 process of making a choice when it feels so strongly like, even more than just a, a, an emotional state like uh, to love or hate that uh, when when there's a deconstructing of a of a decision and how it uh, how it happens there really isn't any self in that that is uh, uh, say uh, an example might be uh, the feelings of pain in your body and you rec- and there's a recognition hmm there's there's pain in, in my legs. I wonder if it's time to move yet. So the mind you know, forms a thought in that way. At that moment, there's a, a an appreciation of the the feelings of pain. Then there's a so there's that sen- the, the physical sensation the the vedana. Then there's uh, a thought. Oh, I wonder if it's time to move the po- to change the posture. So that's a thought. You know, thought is also anicca dukkha anatta. Then there's uh, uh, memory, okay. Um, what happened the last time that I um, endured a, a painful feeling and uh, and chose not to move? There's an exploring of memory, and then there's in the memory there might be oh there's a memory. Oh, well, if I was relaxed and I let the body soften, then I could sit for a long time. If I was tense and rigid, then that was the cause of that knee surgery. <laughs> so uh, that. Drawing upon memory, drawing upon you know, the patterns of experience that have been uh, known in the past, then um, these are, uh, are then say opening up a, 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 a the possibility of say okay well that uh, that pattern is being recognised so that drawing upon that and using intelligence, which is again the the capacity to recognise. And to discern, to discriminate, this too is anicca dukkha anatta. This is this is not who and what we are. It's just the quality of dhamma vijaya, investigating of reality, 
and uh, to recognize okay if there is a relaxation in the body then the pain is <coughs> is not going to be damaging if uh, if the body is not relaxed then the pain is likely to be damaging therefore uh, let's try and relax the body so then that that effort to to relax the body is is a natural result of that discernment so then the the message to the body okay relax <laughs> To sending out the the intention towards the the muscles in the legs and the back, uh, that uh, that that impulse that message is also anicca dukkha anatta. It's a a uh, uh, a natural response coming from that discernment, and then the recognition. Okay, the body's relaxed, the pain has diminished. Okay, and it feels like I can sit here without moving for a bit longer. So even though the thoughts might be, you know, I can sit here for a bit longer without moving. That it may be the thoughts take shape in that I can do this or I, I can do that, but it, those thoughts are also anicca dukkha anatta. Even though the thought is I can sit here a bit longer, that thought is not self. <laughs> Even though it might use the text of I and my my body, I might I can sit and, and my body is relaxed. Those are just uh, ordinary conventional usages, and the, the mind doesn't have to be deluded or identified with that. So, uh, if we if we tease apart uh, a, a, a an experience like that, or uh, when there's a recognition, okay, well, it seems like the body's fully relaxed, but that knee is definitely sending out some serious pain signals. Therefore, it's probably time to change the posture. Then the you know, posture can change, and that uh, that whole assessment of what's going on, and then the 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 choice of how to relate to it. Each element of that, the perception, feeling, memory, uh, the application of of discernment, intelligence, uh, the arising of a of a initiative, all of each piece of those is an each dukkha anatta. None of them really is who and what we are but is uh, when you put them all together it seems like oh i just decided to change my posture <laughs> that it can look like that from the outside but when you take all the elements to, apart when you sort of dismantle the the vacuum cleaner <laughs> and you, you you take all the bits of, uh, apart then you realize oh there isn't actually any essential vacuum cleaner there like the, the buddha said like a chariot you take all the there's no essential chariot when you take the wheels off and the the axle off and the, the foot plate off and there's no chariotness that sits there on its own when you put all the parts together you say chariot or you say a vehicle or vacuum cleaner hoover <laughs> then but there's when you take all the part the bits apart there's no essential hooverness still sitting there it comes only from when you put the parts together. So I would suggest, even when we are making choices, the decisions that we make, when, when there's a close examination and exploring through the practice, we can see, oh, look at that. that there really is not a, a, an I or a me or a mine involved in this. Uh, it can seem that way when there's an attachment and identification, but uh, when that's let go of and there's a, just a, a clear and unbiased exploring and visioning of what's experienced what's going on then we see actually what's guiding choices is attunement to the present the mindfulness and wisdom that's what guides our actions and so then that again helps us to not um, claim success when things go well or, or claim failure and identify with that when things uh, go poorly but we're able to to in a sense just uh, live in a much more fluid and easeful way. Just uh, let the uh, the way that we live and the way we respond to, to people and to our situations be just as natural and as uh, uncomplicated as the body breathing. Just taking in air, breathing it out. We don't take that as a sort of personal achievement or anything that we're especially proud of or embarrassed about. Just the body just breathes. It does. It breathes on its own, and it's uh, it's a very natural and and ordinary easeful function so we can uh, when we we learn to relate to our own uh say uh, choices and to to uh, to see uh, that we can guide uh, how we can guide our life based on mindfulness on wisdom then we 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 live just like breathing with the, with the naturalness and ease of just the body breathing on its own 
we find that our, our life can live itself on its own, that I don't have to be driving this thing. <laughs> I don't have to be in charge. I don't have to be um, sort of taking everything personally. And that, I think that was the, the title of the last uh, book of uh, Ajahn Sumedho's that was printed in this country before he, he left in his retirement was Don't Take Your Life Personally. I think that actually you don't really need to read the book. I think the title just tells you everything. <laughs> don't take your life personally. Well, maybe the the last thing to um, to share this evening, I thought, um, in terms of um, how to not be caught in emotion and uh, where our attention gets most easily swept away, um, where it, it the the habits of identification are very very strong you know, in this so the 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 sort of the deeply um, uh, rooted aspects of our of our mind the um, the the areas where we most easily get carried away in in making choices and also in the emotions where it really feels like it is me i am <laughs> i am upset i am angry i am excited i am inspired i am afraid i am <laughs> that uh, it's so easy to get drawn in and lost in the emotional states and the, the, the habits of identification are very compelling very convincing um, we can use the meditation to help explore and understand that the, the depth of that uh, attachment that identification and train ourselves to to let go of that through using the uh, mindfulness of the body with the, with emotions when the mind is caught up in you know say indignation or excitement or fear or anger um, the attention very easily and very naturally gets drawn to the thing that we're angry about or the thing we're afraid of or the, the thing that we the person that we're jealous of so the uh, the mind gets the attention gets drawn to the story you know what happened what they said or what i did and, and the more compelling the story is and the stronger the emotion then the 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 um the more we tend to get lost in it so when you notice that happening then the most helpful thing to do is to develop uh, body awareness and to see well where does that anger sit in your body when you experience fear where is it in the body when there's jealousy or or um, or greed, you know, how do you feel that? And so, uh, what what we can, uh, I like to encourage as a particular kind of practice is, if you know you've got a, a there's a strong tendency in your makeup, like towards anxiety or towards complaining or towards um, uh, jealousy or resentment, or if there's a particular thing or person <laughs> that you're resentful of or or a, a, an ex-partner, or a current partner, <laughs> or your current spiritual teacher who's annoying you, yeah. uh, whatever it might be, that uh, like a particular area that you're interested to explore, then to take a, a, some time during one of the sitting periods, and to uh, let the mind be as calm and focused as possible, and to deliberately bring up that person's name, or just to um recoll consciously recollect an incident where that emotion was triggered and once you've consciously triggered that emotion whether it's uh, desire or fear or anger whatever it might be then the most important thing is then to take the attention off the story to to once you've triggered it to to not bring attention to the the person or the event but to bring attention to the body so when you feel that resentment, where is it? Is it a tightness in your throat? Is it a, a sharpness between your shoulder blades? Is it an overall heat or vibration? What is it? Where is it? And then let the attention go to that physical sensation, to receive that, to know that, without adding any story to it, just keeping it as non-verbal as possible, and to let that, that feeling, that, that sensation in the body be fully consciously known. And then after a couple of minutes, then start to, to let that go and use the, the breath, particularly the out-breath, to help let that emotional wave dissipate. And it, it's, it, uh, in this kind of practice, it can, be, it can take five seconds to trigger an emotion and 45 minutes for it to dissolve. 
uh, sometimes it can be like that, but it's important to stay with it until it's naturally faded. And then let the whole system then uh, settle down until you've come back to the same quality of spaciousness and stillness that you began from. So in that process, you watch that, that emotional state be born out of nothing, do its thing, and then fade away. You watch the whole cycle, and birth, and then taking form, and then death. It's, the whole cycle has happened. And then while it's been present, there's been an attitude of acceptance. I say, here it is. It's just this, this feeling is here. And then when, when we do this, then what we are able to recognize is that that, that feeling, that emotion, uh, that, that even though you might have all kinds of tangled stories that relate to that person or that event or that quality, um, which are very complicated, the sensations in the body are very simple, very uncomplicated. And that the degree to which they, they're, they're accepted, the, the physical sensations are accepted, you have also find that you've accepted where the situation has come from. You've accepted that um, the patterns of, of attachment within yourself. And in that acceptance, there's a, you're helping them to, to be resolved and to be let go of, to, to loosen the identification with them. And so then when the when you're in a, a sort of live situation and that, that person really is on the phone or <laughs> you are face to face, uh, then as that sort of flush of feeling of excitement or fear or resentment comes flowing through, then you know what to do. You, oh, it's that, it's that flush again. It's that, that tension in the lungs or it's that tightness in the belly. Ah, so you're able to be with that, know it, not get caught in it and to let it go. So that just like the sound of a plane going over or the crewing of a pigeon, you're able to feel that the, the texture of that reaction, to see it as a pattern of nature coming, going, and that's all. So this is another little method that we can employ to help loosen the habits of identification in these areas of our, our, our being, our mind, that, are, that where it gets so dense and it really seems like it's me, it's mine, it's what I am, this is me. To, to help uh, awaken and to, to give strength, confidence to that insight, that, that intuition in the heart that says, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not you. It's not yours. It's not really what you are. <sighs> so I offer these thoughts for consideration this evening.